If you tell a big lie often enough, people will eventually come to believe it and repeat it. What big lie am I tackling in this video? It's one of Satan's oldest lies, repackaged. Paul, you know, to be, be absent of the body is to be, to be seeks to exist. No, to be present with the Lord. This big lie, which James White says is from Paul, is told often, people are believing it, and people are repeating it. Are you believing and repeating this big lie? Stop it. You're simply passing along Satan's repackaged old lie. Satan's old lie goes all the way back to the book of Genesis with Adam and Eve in Genesis 2, 16 through 17 and 3, 4. We see the truth from God in chapter 2, 16 through 17. And Yahweh Elohim instructed the human, saying, From every tree of the garden you may eat, yea, eat. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you must not eat from it, for on the day you eat from it to die you shall be dying. Then along comes Satan and is speaking to the woman. Chapter 3, verse 4. But the serpent said to the woman, Not to die shall you be dying. The contradicting lie could not be any more blatant. In the same way, today's big lie, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, tells people that even in death, you are not really dead, but alive in another realm. It's interesting to note that Dr. James White actually proclaimed the scriptural truth regarding death, then denied it. The absence of the body is to be, to be seeks to exist. No, no, no. So if Paul didn't actually say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, what the hell did he say? Huh? Let's compare the popular big lie with a few translations of 2 Corinthians 5.8. Let's quickly read through these to see if, even on a surface reading, the big lie is saying the same thing as the Apostle Paul. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord from the concordant literal New Testament. Yet we are encouraged and are delighting rather to be away from home out of the body and to be at home with the Lord, from the King James Version. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord, the New International Version. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord, the English Standard Version. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. The repackaged satanic lie is presented as a statement of fact, boldly asserting that, for the believer, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But, as can be clearly seen, that is not what Paul is saying. The fact that Paul is boldly stating is that it is his delight, his preference, to be away from home, out of the body, which is his mortal decaying body, and to be at home with the Lord in his new immortal undecaying body. James White's statement is not scriptural. The false statement makes death a friend and helper that ushers us instantly into immortality with the Lord. But we are told very clearly that death is not a friend, it is an enemy. 1 Corinthians 15.26 tells us the last enemy is being abolished, death. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 1.13, have a pattern of sound words. The big lie statement is not sound. I challenge Dr. James White and anyone else to show us where Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I challenge anyone to show us where this is stated anywhere in the scriptures. Please comment below. Those who repeat this big lie are simply parroting what they've heard others say. Because if they looked into the matter as we are about to do, they would realize that this is a false statement to be found nowhere in the entirety of scripture. Now let's take a look at the context of Paul's statement to see what he was communicating to us. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 8. For we are aware that if our terrestrial tabernacle house should be demolished, we have a building of God, a house not made by hands, Aeonian in the heavens. For in this also we are groaning, longing to be dressed in our habitation, which is out of heaven, if so be that being dressed also, we shall not be found naked. For we also who are in the tabernacle are groaning, being burdened, on which we are not wanting to be stripped, but to be dressed, that the mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now he who produces us for this same longing is God, who is also giving us the earnest of the Spirit. Being then courageous always, and aware that, being at home in the body, we are away from home from the Lord. For by faith are we walking, not by perception." Yet we are encouraged and are delighting rather to be away from home, out of the body, and to be at home with the Lord. 
Paul is speaking here about two bodies, our current mortal body, which is decaying, and our celestial immortal body, which won't decay. Paul tells us what he does not want. He does not want to die. He, unlike James White, knew that death is our enemy. He does not want to be found naked, verse 3. He does not want to be stripped, verse 4. He wants to be dressed in his immortal body. Groaning and being burdened in this decaying body is better than being stripped naked in death. But there's something better than death or life in this mortal body, which is Paul's preference, his delight. He would rather be away from home, out of the body, and to be at home with the Lord. Paul's greatest desire in this passage is to go from this mortal body to the next immortal body with the Lord without the intervening death state. He longed to be dressed with his body, which is out of heaven. He wanted his mortal body to be instantly swallowed up by immortal life. And this was a legitimate desire of Paul's based on a great secret that was revealed to him. There will be a very blessed group of believers who will never die, but will be changed instantly by Christ from mortal to immortal. Paul believed that he would be a part of this blessed group. And why wouldn't he? He anticipated Christ coming back in his lifetime. But unfortunately, God did not grant Paul this great desire of his. But there will be a tremendously blessed group of believers that will not die. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 55, the words of Paul the Apostle. Lo, a secret to you am I telling. We all indeed shall not be put to repose, yet we all shall be changed in an instant in the twinkle of an eye at the last trump. For he will be trumpeting and the dead will be roused incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal put on immortality. Now, whenever this corruptible should be putting on incorruption and this mortal should be putting on immortality, then shall come to pass the word which is written, swallowed up was death by victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? A great secret was revealed to Paul. All believers indeed shall not be put to repose, meaning not all will die. Some will be alive when Christ returns, but all will be changed, the living and the dead. This secret gave Paul the legitimate hope of bypassing death and going to be directly with Christ in his new immortal body. This great blessing will be only for those believers who are alive when Christ returns. When he returns, dead believers will be roused to immortality, and living believers will be changed from mortal and corruptible to immortal and incorruptible. But Paul did not get what he desired. He's dead. He will receive his immortal and incorruptible body at his resurrection. James White's debate opponent, like me, does not believe in the Trinity. And he tried to show that because Jesus was actually and literally dead for three days, that the Trinity was incomplete for three days, and that is a big problem for Trinitarians. James White's response to this was that Jesus was actually alive and well and doing quite a bit of work in between his death and his resurrection. Therefore, the Trinity was in full force while Jesus was dead in the tomb. It was Peter himself that talked about making proclamation to the spirits in prison during that time after the crucifixion before the resurrection. James White is referencing 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20. Let's see if the Apostle Peter agrees with Dr. James White. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20. Seeing that Christ also for our sakes once died concerning sins, the just for the sake of the unjust, that he may be leading us to God, being put to death indeed in flesh, yet vivified in spirit, in which, being gone to the spirits in jail also, he heralds to those once stubborn when the patience of God awaited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being constructed, in which a few, that is eight souls, were brought safely through water. Let's try to determine what Jesus was doing between his death and his resurrection. So, let's locate those two events in this passage. His death is clearly stated and his resurrection is clearly stated. James White tried to tell us that Jesus proclaimed to the spirits in prison between his death and resurrection. This passage shows us very clearly that he went to the spirits in jail after his resurrection. This passage also reveals to us clearly what Jesus was doing between the time of his death and his resurrection. There, that's what he was doing. Nothing. 
He was put to death in the flesh, then nothing for three days. Then he was vivified, which means resurrected to immortality. Now, just read the passage without the traditional misunderstanding that James White is promoting, and the truth is clear. Jesus heralded to the spirits in jail after his resurrection. The spirits in jail are not humans, but spiritual beings. So, James White's mythical trinity was only a twosome for three days. That's not good for the Trinitarian argument. Believing that Jesus actually died and was dead dead, not living dead, is an essential fact that we must accept to realize the truth of our salvation and to be sealed with the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 Now I am making known to you, brethren, the evangel, or the good news, which I bring to you, which also you accepted, in which also you stand, through which also you are saved, if you are retaining what I said in bringing the evangel to you, outside and except you believe feignedly. For I give over to you among the first what also I accepted, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was entombed, and that he has been roused the third day according to the scriptures. Notice in verse 3 the truth that Paul accepted and that we must accept to realize our salvation. Christ died. And Christ was dead according to the scriptural truth of death stated clearly in Ecclesiastes 9.5. The dead know nothing whatsoever. If Jesus was still alive while dead, he would know everything he knew while he was alive, and there would have been no need for him to be roused by his father. He would have simply re-entered his dead body and carried on. Believing that the dead are literally dead is critical truth. Christ died. This big lie that death transports into another realm of life is not only applied to believers and to Jesus, but it is also applied to unbelievers, stating that at the moment of their death, they go to hell where their punishment begins. Peter himself said God knows how to keep under punishment the wicked for the day of judgment, so if they cease to exist, they can't be under punishment. In this clip, Dr. James White is referring to 2 Peter 2.9. The Apostle Peter contradicted what James White said previously. Let's see if Peter will agree with this statement of Dr. James White. 2 Peter 2, 4 through 9. For if God spares not sinning messengers or angels, but thrusting them into the gloomy caverns of Tartarus, gives them up to be kept for chastening judging, and spares not the ancient world, but guards Noah, an eighth, a herald of righteousness, bringing a deluge on the world of the irreverent, and condemns the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, reducing them to cinders by an overthrow, having placed them as an example for those about to be irreverent, and rescues the just man Lot, harried by the behavior of the dissolute in their wantonness. For the just man dwelling among them, in observing and hearing from day to day, tormented his just soul by their lawless acts. The Lord is acquainted with the rescue of the devout out of trial, yet is keeping the unjust for chastening in the day of judging. God has two methods for keeping until the day of judging. For the sinning messengers who do not die, they are held alive in the gloomy caverns of Tartarus. But the unjust dead, like those who died in the flood and in Sodom and Gomorrah, they are kept in death until the day of judging. This will occur at the great white throne when, according to Revelation 20.13, they will no longer be held when the sea gives up the dead in it and death and the unseen give up the dead in them. Jesus also referred to this in John 5.29 as a resurrection of judging. No one is experiencing punishment while they are dead, before they are judged, because, according to Ecclesiastes 9.5, the dead know nothing whatsoever. A judged and punished person would definitely know something. The fact that the dead are the dead dead and not the living dead is perfectly fine with me. Why? Because it's the truth. I hope that you are not comfortable believing myths and lies. It may be a great shock to you to realize that your dead loved ones are not playing checkers with Jesus in heaven. It's okay. They will live again. You will be with them again by the love, mercy, and power of of our God. The sad fact is that we are all dying because of Adam, but the glorious and encouraging truth is that we will all be vivified, made immortal and incorruptible because of Christ our Savior. Death is an enemy of all humanity, an enemy that Jesus will render completely inoperative in all three of its aspects, the dying process, the death event, and the death state. If this video has benefited you, please tap that thumbs up button, 
I promise I won't tell Dr. James White and I will not tell your pastor or your pastor's wife. For more scriptural truths regarding the dead and what they are not doing, I invite you to check out this short playlist. Thank <laughs> you.